Hi everyone, you're uh, at the Tokenomics podcast and today I'm talking to Amit Pratham who came all the way from Silicon Valley. So uh, I would let you introduce yourself. Great, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Amit. I, uh, I've been an, an entrepreneur for, for many, many years, um, deep tech as well as AI, um, and then got involved in the blockchain space uh, about six years ago. Um, I'm an investor with a with my fund as well as uh, with the Silicon Valley Blockchain Society, and deeply focused on the belief that anything I invest in, influence, or create must create a positive impact on the humans it serves. Um, and so, all of the activities we do are modeled around that belief. So, tell us about how did you end up in the space? Because I know that you've been in in tech but specifically blockchain, since it's a new sphere, how mm -hmm. did you end up in blockchain specifically? Yeah, well, I love that you say you're looking for a little of adult conversation here, you know. Um, so my background has been deep tech for the most part. Did my first startup when I was 17, living in Australia. Wow. Um, had that acquired in the US, that's how I moved over. Um, and did deep tech startup since. Um, and I was, I've been involved in the world of AI for a while. Mm -hmm. 14 years ago that I set up a, a lab uh, called Zero, focused on responsible AI, AI that is private. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, one of the things that we needed to do was focus on the data model for AI. That's yeah. one of the big challenges today where you know, data is being consumed by literally a handful of companies and they have become kind of these mega monsters. Yeah. Gaffa Bat, as I call them, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and Tesla. And they kind of represent this idea that everything we do is being inhaled by a handful of companies, yeah. right? Um, and so we were looking at the idea of, you know, how do we decentralize and distribute the data model? so that data is not being consumed and owned by just a handful of companies. And so about six years ago, we started looking at the underlying infrastructure of blockchain. So not so much you know, the currency, but the underlying infrastructure, which also allowed me to start looking at the currency and saying, you know, I, I'll start dabbling in this. But that really wasn't the factor for us. That wasn't as important. Um, the knowledge of, of what this can have and what this can be, rather, was a real important factor in deciding that we would, um, we would start getting into this space and we would start getting into this space from an investment perspective. Um, and so fast forward to 2016, 2017, where the Wild West was at, was, you know, at bucking away at its most. Um, and we really looked at it from two perspectives. One, it's clear there's a there there. You know, once you evolved from the 2008s, uh, where it wasn't clear that there was a there there. Yeah. And, and by 2016, 2017, you could, you could see enough, not from the market speculation perspective, and not from the perspective of people making, you know, hyper money in very short periods of time. You started looking at the infrastructure and said, I can start seeing uh, implications and applications for society at scale from a decentralized perspective. Yeah. And so we, we looked at it and we said, the flip side is all of the behavior that we're seeing is classic behavior of immense immaturity. Mm -hmm. Very young people, I'm not saying just by age, but young behavior yeah. of recklessness of like we can make money really quickly. And so, you know, think back to, you know, when, when we looked at any of, of the deep tech initiatives they were not driven by traders and, and hedges, mm -hmm. right? It was driven by people who said, for better or worse, I think this is high risk, but I believe in it. And so I'm willing to put money behind it. And then hopefully one day, this company will turn out to be a unicorn and we'll make a lot of money from our equity investments, right? That was the, the traditional model. And the whole idea was for the companies that, that got this money, it would be about being as optimized as possible because money is expensive. Yeah. Equity is very, very, very expensive, and the 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 controls that come with it are very expensive, yeah. right? And so you have to think about being as optimized as as possible. Um, there was a there was another factor we were looking at as well, which was 
if you look at any of the tech cycles, 95% of companies that get started in the first, I mean, at all times, but certainly in the first phases, tend to fail, disappear. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing because they generate resources, IP, technology, process know-how, lessons mm -hmm. for the 5% for the that succeed. The, the ones that succeed go on to become category leaders, right? And so you can look at Amazon, you can look at Google, you can look at Facebook, you can look at it in different applied verticals as well. Mm -hmm. But for that journey, they need billions of dollars throughout that whole cycle. And that can't just keep coming from, oh my God, we did this incredible ICO and we raised a billion dollars, right? Yeah. And so you need institutional capital to start playing in this space if you're going to get to that point. And what we realized is you can't have them not participate, stay completely on the sidelines, and then wake up three years from now and say, oh, what a great company, here's a $5 billion check. Yeah. Right? No, it doesn't work absolutely. like that, right? No. And so you need to make sure that they are at the table, that they're being brought on the journey. And so that was, these were kind of the different parameters that were playing through our minds when we decided that we need to do something about it. So I've been running a venture fund for a while uh, with family offices, corporate partners. So I've had kind of that network and that experience. My co-founder in, in uh, Silicon Valley Blockchain Society, David Ellington, amazing, amazing guy, uh, used to be chairman of the San Francisco Pension Fund, mm -hmm. which is about a $20 billion institutional yeah. investor, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in fact, we brought on uh, as our chief investment officer a gentleman named David Kushner, who used to be both the CIO, chief investment officer, of the SF Pension Fund. That's how he knows David Ellington. Mm -hmm. And then went on to be the chief investment officer of the uh, La Serra, which is the LA County Pension Fund, which is about $50 billion. So really significant institutional capital. And so we combined these networks and we started bringing some of these thoughtful investors into the room, knowing fully well that the crypto OGs, the angels, the VC funds, the family offices, mm -hmm. they're the ones who will deploy capital in the more short term. Yeah. But then you need some of these larger fund of funds, scaling, big family yeah. offices, institutionals to think about that long-term future. And for us, it was about bringing everyone together. And in fact, what we also did was we brought the, the young, you know, I don't mean to stereotype, but the tattooed anarchist, if you may. Okay. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, the large company, the large bank, the large enterprise software company, uh, their, uh, them into SVBS as well, because our core belief was that Disruption is a collaborative sport. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Right? And so you need to have all of the actors at the table, including the ones getting disrupted. It, it's very interesting that you said that because I, I have a feeling very often when you talk to people in the space, it's, it's either one extreme or the other. One extreme says, you know, uh, we actually came up with this model of ICOs uh, because we want independence, because we don't want to ban the front of the VCs and we don't want that control and, uh, you know, we want a, a more independent way of running mm -hmm. our own business. Um, and more democratized way of, of fun getting funding. Sure. Um, the other extreme are VCs who say that, yes, uh, you know, we understand this is a new field, but we have our own rules and, and you yeah. have to play with our rules and kind of, you know, when you're raising funds and approaching us, you should come with, with you know, the same way and approach us the way we are used to see things mm -hmm. and evaluate things. So um, I, I like the way that you've, you've looked at all the angles of the thing and, and put this together because I feel that institutional investors have to get used to the space and Absolutely. have to understand it, first of all, Correct. before realizing whether they would like to be part of it in terms of investor, being Correct. investor or not. Correct. Absolutely. And if you think about it, it's a new asset class and there are interesting mechanics with that asset class. You yeah. know, the concept of ongoing liquidity is, is new, but very exciting, yeah. even from an LP perspective, right? From an institutional perspective. There's a new culture class, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, I, I always say that um, people forget that this decentralized space was not born in 2008. 
it wasn't just born out of out of you know um, Satoshi's white paper and whatever she intended to mean by that, right? It, I think that if you look back at some of the oldest developers in this space, mm -hmm. they come from, from countries that either have authoritarian regimes, have collapsing currencies, have hyperinflation. Yeah. And there's a common thread with that. Regardless of those vector points, um, there's a lack of freedom, there's a lack of control, especially for young, talented, technical youth, yeah. Yeah. right? And th the principle of decentralization is that power and incentives have become too deeply centralized. This is, we can, we can have a, a separate conversation about politics around this, right? There's a, there's a uh, Brexit, Trump, and decentralization conversation to yeah. be had at yeah. some point. <laughs> but the reality is that th there are some fundamental principles that this new decentralized revolution was working towards. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we have you know, the, the technology that enables some of these things to happen. Mm -hmm. But it's just technology. We've yeah. had these cycles before and, and we don't think twice about, about the TCP IP frameworks on which, or the protocol on which the internet works today. I mean, how many times in conversation do we talk about that? But we talk about an app and we talk about a service, right? And we talk about you know, calling a car, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't care about that stack, the framework, yeah. the protocol. We and don't need to know how it works. We, we don't need to know how it works, as right? Long as and it works and it brings benefit to our it, everyday it, life. It, we're exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then the layer on top, which is very interesting. We've got currencies, we've got commodities, we've got you know the whole token ecosystem and and token mechanics, token economics that are really thoughtfully done, yeah. that involve not just a young developers saying, hey, I need to throw a token model onto my system, but thinking about macroeconomics of it. Mm -hmm. How does this affect the overall ecosystem? Yeah. You need economists at the table, right? Um, you need to think about microeconomics. You need to think about what, what that does within the system, yeah. not just in easy buzzword terms of inflation and velocity. Right? There's far more to it. When you sit down with real economists, you, can, you, you, you get to understand you know, the impact of what happens when you design a system a particular way. Yeah. Right? Um, and so the part that excites me the most of, of this decentralized revolution is the idea of governance mm -hmm. and how governance has changed. And what that means, not just for companies or ecosystems, but what that means for governments what that means for democracy at large, mm -hmm. right? The introduction of a consensus model. Yeah. And we can argue till the cows come home whether proof of work is the one that should remain or proof of stake or you know, um, whatever evolutions we have from that, right? There's been a huge movement on the VC side, right? The way that we, we invest, the clauses that we use, it's become, you know, YC has pioneered a lot of this. Mm -hmm. It's very, very entrepreneur friendly. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I don't mean to sound like I don't like the idea of, of democratized financing of projects that affect people the most. And that if you can raise money from the people who are actually involved in the impact of that project, that's fantastic, right? Yeah. Um, that's not what happened with the ICOs. You had speculative investors just coming in and, 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 and hedging really quickly and many irresponsible founders as well absolutely <laughs> right that. Yeah. yeah so if you think about you know you think about the kind of the that for so many of these projects and we can look back at the history of so many technologies including you know things like ai which arguably has way more technological sophistication or if yeah. not sophistication is just far more intense yeah than, than the blockchain and even there, companies have built incredible multi-billion dollar companies, uh, founders have built out of, you know, five, eight, 10, 12 million dollar rounds of financing. Yeah. This concept that you could do 120, 130 million in a first round. Which you don't need. Exactly, so then yeah. what you do is you get incredibly indisciplined, yeah. right? I always say, you know, um, when you get a, a VC round, you have to start bootstrapping at a different level. 
Yeah. Right? And you have to be exceedingly optimized about your capital. You have to spend it on the right people, on the right things. Yes. You know, you don't spend it on yacht parties and on expensive cars. And that just that's just not the way you can build long-term value. Yeah. But because of the way a lot of the ICOs were structured, you don't care about too much long-term value. I you think had... it's, it's you know, this parallel of rich kids who are not motivated to mm. sort of push themselves to, to learn more or to do something because it's there already. So yeah. it's, it's you know, relatively easy money that came to you, right. you know, for doing, for not building anything yet, for not trying anything yet, for just having an idea. So once you have that easy money in, you spend it easier as well. And, and, you know, because of the regulatory field back then, you do also don't have that responsibility and sure. accountability in place. Yeah. So you mentioned consensus. Mm. Um, do you think that could eventually at one point be used for the investing process as well and investment decision making somehow like decentralizing that investor power, not the ICO model type of thing, but somehow, I don't know, voting consensus or somehow kind of more objective and democratized way of picking the projects who would get funding? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think there's a lot of experimentation that needs to happen before that, right? So it's almost like you can think of an, an angel list model, yeah. right? Um, where, where as long as a well thought through consensus model is met, that somehow capital is deployed automatically. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could eventually get to a point, imagine a VC fund that has no people. Right, like that decision making is influenced by AI, that the model of investment is, is driven by consensus, yeah. deployment of funds is done on the blockchain, results are measured quantitatively and qualitatively. So you can see that being the evolution over time. You always have to ask the question, um, is that needed, mm -hmm. right? And so I would make the argument that you know, eventually I can see something like that being a model that happens certainly for democratized, decentralized investments. Uh, but today, what are the challenges we face in terms of deploying capital? Are the challenges that we have, um, that we don't have thoughtful, experienced fund managers mm -hmm. who truly understand the space? Yeah. And that's why we need to have it in some form of automated um, AI driven way on the blockchain. Do we have a case of lack of accountability in terms of how the funds are deployed? So if you draw the parallel with let's say nonprofits that are getting funds deployed for projects in Africa or um, you know in, in refugee mm -hmm. colonies where you can say wait a minute like there's so little accountability you know 22 percent of all the money that goes in disappears mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There, there's a brilliant, compelling case of saying, well, hold on a second, let's put this all onto the blockchain. Yeah. Let's find a way to create consensus models for people to actually get the money and we can create incredible accountability going forward. Right now, I don't think those two things apply. I don't think that, you know, when I look at it from a VC perspective, you know, we have controls in place of how capital goes in. You yeah. can be certain that capital goes in. You can be certain it goes to the right account. Right. All of those things exist. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I don't look at it and say of the things that are the most compelling needs right now, is that where we should be putting our attention? Okay. Yeah. What I will say is that, look, the space needs more money. Yeah. The space needs more responsible money. And, you know, there are ecosystems around the world. You know, the days are gone where if you wanted the best deal flow, sit in an office in Jackson Square in San Francisco. Right? It's very simple. It doesn't matter where it comes from, it shows up there. Right? Those days are gone. And, and as someone who has an office in Jackson Square and lives <laughs> in San Francisco, I would say that's a good thing. You know, I like the idea that not all deals have to be Silicon Valley deals. Okay. Right? That there's fantastic companies being built out of London and Berlin and Taipei and, and Sydney, and, and this is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Right? What's missing, I think, is good long-term capital mm -hmm. that yeah. can come and play through all the different stages. For sustainability. For, yeah. for, for you know, these businesses, you know, people often, again, and this is, you know, you made that point of, you know, the ICOs, it's just this quick money, right? Mm -hmm. 
But true success of businesses, right? Startups take 10 years yeah. to become truly successful, mm -hmm. right? Um, every overnight success is seven to 10 years in the making. Yeah, You've yeah. heard that one many because times. Because no one talks about the failures, they always publicize the success. So everyone thinks that that was the first try. Exactly. Success at the end, yeah. And so, so that certainly we need, right? We need good, thoughtful, long-term capital. That certainly we need. We need good, thoughtful, long-term capital. But the reality is that um, where we are right now, we should be thinking about what do we need for the next 10 years? So one of the things we always do at SVBS, and I certainly do this with you know, my investing activity, is um, if you can't answer the question, is this relevant for the next 10 years, mm -hmm. then you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. You shouldn't be investing in it, right? Um, and it really changes the way then you can think about the space and, and, and you can protect the space because from our perspective, we think what's happening in this space with the innovation, with the young talent coming in, wanting to change the world basically is mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. And the reason we're bringing this thoughtful, long-term view is we actually want to protect that yeah. and ensure that it can continue and live on. Let's go back to the beginning because you mentioned you were 17 year old when you founded your own startup. Mm. And then you mentioned also that 95% of startups failed. So uh, what happened to your startup and what was it about? So it was a it was a startup that did um, we we did integration adapters that allowed um, companies to take data from their existing systems and bring it to the web, mm -hmm. and in, in you know in, in the late nineties that was a big deal, yeah. um, and so you know it it got uh, acquired into a company in in during the dot com boom and then four months later you know things changed dramatically, the bottom fell out. And we've seen that now in this cycle again, right? We see those cycles repeat themselves. But you know, one of the benefits of youth and, and also being in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, you're just ready to go again, Yeah. you know? And, and you're ready to go with the next thing. And most of the time you evolve from where you are already, yeah. right? So it's rare that you find, uh, find people who do a startup in one area succeed or fail, it's either ways is fine, yeah. um, and then show up a year later and are doing something entirely different. Mm -hmm. That happens, it happens, but it's quite rare. What happens more often is that you then, you fine finish tune. your earn out and yeah. then you're ready to fine tune and say, well, you know what the evolution of this actually is and let me build this now. So do you think it's important for, for, you know, for people who are on the other side of the fence, the investors, yeah. to have been founders before in order to actually you know, resonate with, with the other side of, of, of the space where you, know, you are investing in people and in projects? I, I think so. I think, look, if you look at, just go back to Silicon Valley, if you look at some of the best investors in, in the last 15 years or 20 years, they're all ex-founders, mm -hmm. right? They're people who had successful companies and then created funds. They come at it with a different mindset. Um, they come at, it, come at it with a mindset of, you know, the entrepreneur is your biggest asset. They're not, they're not a transaction, mm -hmm. right? I always say, you know, when, when, when I invest in, in companies, one is I have deep relationships with the founders yeah. um, because that's what you're investing in. You're investing in, in, in the ability to go on a journey with someone that mm -hmm. seems utterly improbable, and yet you're going to create some wonderful magic from it, right? You're creating, um, you're creating families along the way. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my founders, like, I'm available to you all the time. I'll roll up my sleeves and come and play in whatever way you want. Um, I'm not gonna be sitting there asking you for numbers, um, but if you have a customer you want to try and meet, or you have a market that you want access to, um, you know, I'm a email, phone call, is message away. Is this a common practice among the VC funds? It's, that's not what I've heard about them usually from the founders, that's why I'm asking. So I think the better funds, right, operate in that way. You know, there are some amazing, amazing VCs in the market who have been founders before. They will, you know, roll up their sleeves and, and, mm -hmm. and be on this journey with you. And I think, you know, smart founders should do their research 
and identify who they want to align with. That doesn't mean that you know they necessarily are going to give them funds, but um, you know, do your research and find out, you know, who are the 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 VCs who, you know, want to work for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So VCs ha are in a position where you know they have many possibilities. They have they see many many blockchain projects. Yeah. that uh, are pitching them um, and you know there are different ways of evaluating the project and choosing them depending on the VC profile and what they prefer to look at right um, what are uh, you looking at like what are the parameters that and, and the components that are very important to you that you look at first when you are trying to pick uh, blockchain projects like one out of ten for example yeah. So we take a slightly different view on, on how we pick projects. So one view is, of course, is this relevant for the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. The other view is part of how um, I invest in the things that I work on. If they don't have a net positive impact on the humans they serve, mm -hmm. and, and this is you know, an important way to, to think about the market, I don't want to know who your target customer is. I don't know, I don't want to know what your target market is. I want you to speak as, as an entrepreneur in the language of who are the humans that you plan to serve. Okay. Yeah. If you look at the world that way, the way you treat your customers mm. is very different compared yeah. to a target person, right? Mm. Um, and if indeed it's the humans that you're trying to serve, then um, it changes the way you design your product and offering for them. Yeah. It changes the way you think about how will they interact with the product, mm -hmm. right? And again, this has sure. been a challenge in the blockchain space. You know, we, yes, we've, we've had a lot of incredible layer one stuff being built. We're starting to see some layer zero to support it now. And then of course, you know, now you see the, what, what I would call the applied blockchain mm -hmm. utilization. It's the same thing happened with the AI cycles, right? In the, in the beginning, it was all about Hollywood's impression of AI. Yeah. You, know, you talk to people outside of our tech bubbles, yeah. what do you know about AI? And they'll reference one of 12 movies, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's either her or, you know. Or something very exciting or very scary. Or very or, dystopian, you know, right? Or right, it's exactly. Take your job. Yeah. And most of the time it tends to be more dystopian because that, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. provocative and it's, it's yeah. a very Hollywood thing. And it works, right, from a Hollywood perspective. Um, and then you started seeing most of the investments were in platform AI, right? Mm -hmm. So that lots of voice recognition, and, and yeah. then you saw, you know, whether it's the autonomous car systems. Um, and now you see some of the best AI companies are doing stuff in medicine, they're doing stuff in, you know, financial services, things like that. And from that perspective, we're, we're starting to see at SVBS, we certainly see a lot of companies that are trying to solve vertical problems, solving mm -hmm. problems that meet certain human challenges. We love that, right? Yeah. So that's another aspect of what we look at. And what is the real problem that this is trying to solve? Mm -hmm. um, we really like to look at um, companies where the founders, we, we totally support first-time founders. Mm -hmm. What we have seen is some of the smartest first-time founders are teaming up with people in experience in the domain that they're trying to tackle, yeah. right? And this comes under the team dynamics. So obviously we look at that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, we always ask the question, does this need to be decentralized, mm -hmm. right? Because the answer can sometimes be maybe not, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, two is, does this need to have its own currency? Mm -hmm. Or if they're issuing a token, they're issuing yes. a token mm -hmm. is that even necessary, yeah. right? Or is this, are you just issuing a token because that's a way to raise money? Right. Are there mechanics of the token that are unique to the system, in which case that's incredibly powerful? Mm -hmm. And in which case, are you thinking about the to tokenization and the economics of it mm -hmm. in a thoughtful, holistic way? Or otherwise, so, you just issue equity shares, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we're relatively cross-stage, so we're quite happy to invest very early. We're very happy to bring companies into our network later. Our network tends to have a lot of expertise as well, and that's how we've curated the network too. So there's you know, people who have you know, been on the founding teams of some of these large protocols, people who have been you know, thoughtful leaders in this space early, people who have, been, uh, who have run public companies, people who have sold startups, mm 
um, people who have been involved in the regulatory frameworks, people who have been at government. So you look at it from all different angles. From all different yeah. angles, yeah. because look at what's what keeps a company from a startup from being successful. It's different challenges of execution at different stages, yes. all requiring different kind of skills. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If you go to a startup founder and say, "What do you need right now?" The answer is always capital, guaranteed. But right? that doesn't solve Exactly. Issues. And I always say what you need is what that capital can potentially buy. But yeah. if you don't understand that and if you don't create the right networks for it, you won't get the right people who can take you to the right places. Yeah. And the history of all successful startups is, is built and littered in who they brought to the table. Who joined the team? Who were the advisors? How involved were they? Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, you remember the ICO times where you just had this big page of advisors, and the more advisors you had, the more money you ostensibly and the same advisor raised. in 40 different projects. Absolutely, and some they didn't know they were in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so we were, like, from the beginning, really careful, you know, when startups came to us and said, you know, we, and you, as you can imagine, mm. we'd get, like, you know, many, many of these, you know, projects where oh, they yeah, wanted yeah, us as advisors. Imagine, yeah. and we're like, I have no value to add here, yeah. right? And I, as an advisor, I want you to look at the project as you would as an investor. Yeah. So does it meet all of those requirements? Would you deploy capital in here? And if you wouldn't, just don't be an advisor there. Yeah, right? because it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fair enough to get involved in something you don't believe in. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Or you're, you're you know, invested yeah. in. I don't mean just financially, where you're invested in, yeah. right? Yeah. What is the value? Do you have expertise? Do you have access? So a big part of SVBS is, you know, is this incredible network. And for many of the companies that have come into SVBS, they're meeting people for projects in Africa. They're meeting partners in China. They're meeting partners in Europe. Yeah. Um, and, and they've found incredible advisors or they've found, you know, people who can contribute in a very specific way. And we think that's really important. Oh, it is. It's absolutely. Yeah. Connections and relationships go very far mm. these days. Uh, so... What are your views of, you know, we had the ICO boom in the beginning, yeah. then it, it sort of tried to transition into an STO model, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's, it's, it's a big question whether it works out or not. Yet. Right. And then um, many people are very excited about the IEO mm -hmm. part of it. Um, so what do you think? Like, where are we going? Is it is it sort of... Uh, the crowdfunding model of, of all these different ways of looking at it. Uh, is this the way to go? Uh, is it mature enough to sort of look at it even? Or uh, we're still early and we're just experimenting to see what works best? Look, I think at the highest level, this is super early, right? Mm -hmm. Like people often, I, I always tell people when, when, when you get into discussions of financing models, or you get into discussions of throughput and scale, and I always say, you know, for people who say, look, my existing infrastructure is, you know, uh, 10,000 times faster. Mm -hmm. It has more scale. It has more reliability. Why would I do this? Right. And it's like, yeah, because this is a one month old industry. Mm -hmm. We often forget that because what happened with the with the rise and rise of Bitcoin is that it got mainstream attention yeah. that made it seem like this long, mature industry. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. True. But we're not. We might be in year 11, but we're not even really in year 11, yeah. right? And so, so it's very early on in the space, which means all of the mechanics of the space are early. They're experimental, okay. right? Yeah. And, and that's okay. Look, we, we tried the ICO. We saw what about it didn't work, right? Mm. There's still ICOs happening. Yeah. They're being operated differently. The IEO solves a lot of some of the challenges of the indiscipline of the ICOs, mm -hmm. but it doesn't solve the issues that the SEC has with, with the ICOs. Yeah. Whether it's done from an exchange or it's done from somebody's website, from an SEC perspective, it's an unregistered security, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sure. So from that perspective, the IEO doesn't solve anything other than saying, look, I bring in some of the other guardrails. I bring in the professionalism, I bring in the accountability that someone's website couldn't do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I bring in the market making that a, someone's website liquidity. couldn't yeah, do yeah. and, mm -hmm. and actual liquidity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, an IEO is interesting. It, I think it'll evolve. Uh, we're seeing different evolutions of the STOs. 
Um, all of this comes within the parameters then of considering jurisdictions. Yeah. You know, uh, is this something, when you look at it from the U.S. perspective, it's not only that most of these things are not allowed, it's that there isn't clarity yet yeah. about what's going to happen. And that's a challenge, right? So as a, as a U.S. investor, I, I worry about that. I want them to come up with laws that allow us to go one way or the other. Yeah. Um, if you're in Switzerland, you know, they have a, a good wider uh, acceptance of different token types, yeah. which is great, which is why you see a lot of projects operating we'll out of there, there yeah. right? Um, you have startup ecosystems like Malta and Liechtenstein and Luxembourg that are saying, oh, we used to be great places for other kinds of companies to operate. Can we give you a framework, mm. right? All of this will play out over time. And does this mean you don't play? No, of course not. It just means that you play with the knowledge that stuff is evolving. It's good you mentioned that because these days, if you are a founder of a blockchain startup, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are so many possibilities, regulatory frameworks, different countries to go to, different ways of getting funding. Yeah. Um, how do you like how a founder of a blockchain project can figure out what's the best place and the best way to raise capital for for the firm yeah because there are so many options out there absolutely and as you said most of them are experimental at this stage yeah so, uh, how do we go about it it depends on what you're doing it depends on um what kind of capital you want Uh, it depends upon what is your token model, mm -hmm. if you have tokens. Uh, it depends upon where your initial market is. Um, luckily, we're, we're, we're operating more in a global perspective now. Gone are the days where the only way a, a US VC would invest in you is if you were a Delaware C corporation, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So we're evolving from that. We're all looking at international deal flow. We're looking at the best companies everywhere. Um, the technology allows companies to be global anyways. Mm -hmm. If you build an AI company, um, using data sets in local markets allow you, allows you to work in those markets. Yeah. Then it's just about the focus of where do we start? Where do we have infrastructure? Which market can we first dominate? Mm -hmm. And then we can roll out to subsequent markets, right? Um, so I think founders need to be really, really thoughtful about all of this. If you're a company in Silicon Valley and your main Uh, economics of the system is utilitarian. Mm -hmm. Either you have to raise an equity round, and that's completely fine, or you can't be a Silicon Valley company, mm -hmm. right? And then you start looking at other jurisdictions and you say, where should we be that permits us to optimize for the kind of um, token ecosystem we need, mm -hmm. right? If you want to do a registered security, um, then you need, to th you need to think about who you want your investors to be. If you need it to be more of an American play, then you know exactly what to do with, with the different um, uh, yeah. regulatory frameworks in the U.S. So I would say for most founders, it's a combination of thoughtful, long-term thinking around structure. Mm -hmm. And then the other reality, which is, well, where do I have access and where am I going to get money, right? So if you're a London-based founder, and you have these grandiose plans of a utility, utility token system. Mm -hmm. Yes, you need to probably move to Zoog. Mm -hmm. But if the first 10 people who are going to trust in what you're building are 10 angels here in London, then think about an equity round okay. as Stay the first way to do yeah. it. Build out, show results, mm -hmm. and then say, you know what, we're ready to launch uh, a tokenized platform And so we're going to create an issuer that is in a jurisdiction that allows it. Okay. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, what do you think about this romantic image of Silicon Valley? Because, you know, I, I'm, I've been into conversations over lunch and coffee where people say, and, and a disclaimer, I've never been in the US, so yeah. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just saying what I've heard, yeah. yeah. So um, they are saying like, Oh, you know, if you're raising funds, if you're a startup founder, and you should definitely make a trip there and you should network and meet investors. Mm -hmm. Is it as romantic and, and easy and nice as it sounds? <laughs> so absolutely not, right? I mean, the, the whole 
oh, I'll show up in San Francisco and shake a tree and put five million into my bank account and build this amazing company is, is just silliness. Mm -hmm. What is true though, is the Silicon Valley is still the most sophisticated financing ecosystem, especially for the tech industry, mm -hmm. cross stage. Mm -hmm. Investors have tremendous knowledge of um, of helping scale companies. Mm -hmm. They have an incredible appetite for what can be. Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part, investors have a really good uh, approach to how they think about helping founders. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that earlier. And, and sure, there are you know, purely financial VCs and you, know, you should stay away from them, right? But th the reason you go to the Valley is because you really want capital at scale and the, the experience and knowledge that comes with that capital. Mm -hmm. But the belief that somehow you can show up, shake a tree and, and, and money falls into your lap is not true. Yeah, I mean, it sounds too good to be true. To it's, be <laughs> and, and they're very professional yeah. investors, right? So they're mm -hmm. going to look at all of the reasons why they would invest. Um, and in some cases, they would have the ability to invest in a company that's not local. And mm -hmm. in other cases, they might not. Um, but I think that uh, in general, is it a case that if you want to succeed, you go to Silicon Valley and nowhere else? That's not true anymore. I think there's brilliant companies we've seen succeed out of the London ecosystem. Yeah. DeepMind is a good example. Yes. Um, we've seen amazing companies come out of the Berlin ecosystem. We're seeing, because of cost structures and regulatory frameworks, uh, companies that start in San Francisco and then, you know, come to Berlin mm -hmm. or, or come to London or come to you know, some other ecosystems like that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, my advice is you want to be part of the Sil Silicon Valley ecosystem mm -hmm. because there's incredible people in there, there's incredible value in there. You might need money from Silicon Valley at later stages anyways. Yeah. Start building the relationships now. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're shaking the tree, you're going there and you're shaking enough hands, That's you're exactly. showing that you're, you know, you sh you're sharing your vision, you're showing that you deliver, and you build the relationships and trust that convert to capital. Later on, yeah. Later on. Yeah, makes sense. So, um, your projections, you, you, you said we are very, in a very early stage, but also, you know, since you're in the space, you, you truly believe in, in the power of technology and digitalization yeah. and that it's going to change uh, the way we live these days. So, um, I know it's very theoretical, but like, how, how do you see this evolving? What is the ultimate kind of uh, result of, of everything that you know, good players are bringing to the ecosystem in the future. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it'll be very similar going back to what we got post the dot-com mm -hmm. implosion, right? We got high quality companies run exceedingly well, yeah. very professional, made their way to public markets, mm -hmm. right? In whatever capacity, but made their way to public markets with all of the compliance and professionalism that comes with it. They become the category, le category leaders of, of their space. Mm -hmm. They tend to have a strong vertical focus over time, right? Yeah. And so once you graduate from the Amazons and the Googles, uh, you start seeing companies that are leaders in healthcare and um, financial markets, right? Travel, mm -hmm. things like that, right? And we'll start seeing that. We'll start seeing repeat founders coming in and and building because they see genuine problems that they want to solve for mm -hmm. and they see genuine problems that they can solve for with decentralization not because decentralization is cool or that everyone is doing it right so let's take an example let's take something like identity mm -hmm. provenance yeah. supply chain these are wonderful examples of why the blockchain and the technologies that go with it and clever tokenomics around it make sense We'll start seeing identity solutions that not only just apply to the enterprise world we live in or the consumer world we live in mm -hmm. or governments, but imagine when it starts becoming relevant and you know this is something that I'm involved in um, with the Norwegian Refugee Council. It's a refugee agency that, you know, phenomenal refugee agency, over eight and a half million refugees that they touch one way or the other. And one of the big challenges is the identity of these refugees, 
right? And if you create another decentralized identity for them, you risk the same challenge that if the issuer doesn't exist anymore or you don't mm -hmm. recognize the issuer, then yeah. you don't have a way of checking that ID document. It's a wonderful use case for the blockchain, Absolutely, right? Yeah. Provenance of people's skills and life, provenance of what they own, mm -hmm. right? Supply chain of goods and services, yeah. right? These are great examples and we'll see them play out. I am not just super optimistic because we have so many startups, but we also have large companies who are part of SVBS. We see the projects they're working on, yeah. right? And that's when you know that not only is this real, but this is on an incredible path. And if we are patient enough, if we recognize that this is a one month old baby and it has an incredible future and it's a future not in isolation of what we have in, in the centralized world, but it is in complement of what we have in the centralized world. Yeah. Then remember disruption will be a collaborative sport and we will all win. And it won't be a zero sum game of winner takes all but it will be the underlying ph philosophy of decentralization, which is that we can all win, that we can create a yeah. more equitable society. And I always say that at the end of the day, for us, that revolution, the, the mission of SVBS is to fund the revolution. Mm -hmm. For us, the revolution is not just the outsized financial returns that this new asset class and new culture class can create. But the impact but the impact mm -hmm. of creating a society of, by, and for the people. Mm -hmm. And the irony of that is that is a fundamental tenet of democracy in the US Constitution, and yet anyone in their right mind will tell you that democracy today is not of, by, and for the people. Mm -hmm. Power and incentives have accrued only to a few. Which is why the whole need of the decentralization came Exactly, into place this is why we all exist yeah. and do what we do. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy it sort of closed the loop. So uh, I, I guess, you know, uh, all I can do is thank you for your time. Most uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, it was a really interesting conversation. So um, I wish you luck with, with what you're doing because it feels like it's very important. And um, I hope to see more successful startups coming out of your portfolio. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks.